here is the real Mediterranean. Here is a country where the sunshine never ends. An island where the glorious tones of green are embraced by the blues and turquoises of the Mediterranean, and where the earth guards the secrets of history under the golden brightness of the sun. Despite the small size of the island, every square meter of it has sustained humanity for thousands of years and brims with traces of different civilizations. It does not only bear witness to the mysterious history of the Mediterranean, but in northern Cyprus you can delight in the light diffused blue of the sea and the hottest yellow of the sun. Because of all these characteristics, northern Cyprus is a real Mediterranean yet to be discovered by you, a place where time stands still. Most of the historical riches of the island are concentrated in the northern part of Cyprus. Fairy tale castles built on the Carinia mountain range, peaking at a height of 177 meters. Buildings dedicated to different religions and untouched coasts all exist together in this geographical splendor, enhanced by the gentle sound of the waves. Not only does it have untouched coasts, which give shelter to the nesting sea turtles, it owns endemic plants rare flowers, pine-clad mountains, and orange groves. North Cyprus is a center for history and culture. This small island offers you the real Mediterranean with its vast golden beaches, rich history, and special quality of light, as well as sunshine all the year round, appearing from the monastery of Apostolos Andreas in the far east in the village of Yeshid Irmak in the far west. Mythology's most beautiful woman was born in Cyprus into the waves of the Mediterranean Sea. We have no doubt that Aphrodite, the goddess of love, is the most bewitching woman of the mythological world with her lovers and the legends that she has left behind. You can sense her beauty everywhere as you swim in the sea or as you wander in the landscape. It is magical to have a holiday on the goddess Aphrodite's island. The island of Cyprus is a meeting place of many religions and was also an important point on trade routes of the eastern Mediterranean. Because of its location at the crossroads of eastern and western civilizations where the continents collide, the island has been home to different civilizations at many times over throughout the ages. It was ruled by a number of civilizations from different cultures and its beauty has been preserved through time. All through its long history, the island of Cyprus has carried traces of numerous civilizations. One can see the evidence of the Egyptians, the Ptolemies, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Lusinians, the Venetians, the Ottomans and the British. The island of Cyprus, which contains the most precious part of our world heritage, continues to share its 10,000-year-old historical past with its fellow humans. Nicosia is the capital city of northern Cyprus, which covers 3,355 square kilometers. Centuries ago, there were only settlements in the area, which were surrounded by walls. However, today, the city has flowed beyond the walls and it is gradually becoming more developed. The Venetian engineer Guilio Savognano built the Nicosia walls, which have a circumference of three miles. They have three entrance gates and eleven bastions. Savognano's ramparts are commonly viewed as a masterpiece. Today, these gates through the ramparts have lost their function because the roads were opened up on both sides to allow the traffic ease of movement. Two of the gates are in southern Cyprus and one, the Carina Gate, is in the north. The Nicosia city walls surround a unique place on the island of Cyprus, an old city where several civilizations from different periods of history coincide. It is not surprising to see that the remnants of these civilizations in the city The Great Inn, which is considered the most important Ottoman building, has been restored recently with a sensitivity that reflects Cypriot culture. The Inn is a two-floor building with 68 rooms. Although it was known as New Inn when it was first built, 
It was also known as Alanyullah's Inn as it was a resting place for tradesmen from Alanya in Turkey. In the 17th century, when a small inn called the Gambler's Inn was built in nearby Asmalta Square, the new inn, by comparison, was given the name the Great Inn. Another feature of the Great Inn is that it is the biggest inn in Cyprus and it is situated in the center of the old walled city. Also in the old city, there is another historical treasure. This is the Selimia Mosque, which was once a cathedral named Saint Sophia. The building was converted into a mosque in 1571 when the Ottomans took control of the island. This was where the coronations of the Lizunian kings were held. It is also the largest mosque from the Ottoman period. The Venetian column positioned at the centre of the historical Sarayoni Square is an outstanding column that visitors cannot help seeing. The Venetian column in Cyprus, a symbol of military and political might of the Venetians, testifies to one of the values that Venetians left behind. The Mevlevi Tekke, south of Karunia Gate to the old city of Nicosia, is one of the most important buildings in historical as well as architectural terms. The Mevlevi sect, an offshoot of Islam, encouraged an inclusive approach which embraced humanity without any religious discrimination. This approach ensured its survival on the island for a very long time. It is said that the central Tekke of the Mevlevi sect in Cyprus was built on land donated by a woman called Emine Hatun in the beginning of the 17th century. Starting in 1873, there were 36 people living in the Tekke. These people included Masnavihans, Sheikhs and Dervishes. After the Mevlevi Tekke had been closed down for many years, it was put into service again on the 30th of April 1963 under a new title and function as a Turkish Ethnography Museum. However, it was later decided that it should be totally rearranged as a museum of the Mevlevi Tekke, and it was restored accordingly between the years of 2001 and 2002. The exhibition part of the museum was reorganized and put into service in 2002. One can see great many beautiful historical buildings in the old city of Nicosia. The Saman Bahja houses, said to be the first social housing in Cyprus, reflect the simple architectural features of their period, their function blending harmoniously with their surroundings. There are 70 houses, built in the beginning of the 20th century, marking a significant step in invigorating city planning. The houses of the Arab Ahmed Quarter, close to the Papos Gate, also show the harmonious design of the old city. This district, close to what was known as the Papos Road during the Ottoman period, Victoria Road during the British colonial period, and now the Shehid Salahi Shevket Road today, has a long history that even goes back beyond the Luzinian period. There are places that are a must to visit, which convey a sense, an atmosphere of the historical age they bear witness to. They are the Sachakli House, the Dervish Pasha Mansion, the Sultan Mahmud II Library, the Banda Bulya, the courthouses, the post offices, the Bakufla Central Building, and the Great Inn. When you leave Nicosia and take a trip across the island, you will find yourself in Juniper Forest almost immediately. At the point where the sea meets the land, the monastery of Apostolos Andreas rises like a mirage to greet you amidst the gentle tones of green. The monastery is located at the place known as the Cape of St. Andrew, 
and is dedicated to the Apostle Andrew. It is a holy place where St. Andrew is still worshipped as the protector of travellers and workers of miracles. The Carapaz Peninsula is a protected area, now a national park, and is full of juniper forests. It is hardly surprising that the true owners of these forests are the donkeys of Cyprus. These Cyprian donkeys, which have their place in world literature, live their lives in freedom in this area of outstanding natural beauty. Long golden beaches line the south of this green mantle where a number of endemic plants grow. These coasts have always provided shelter for the nesting sea turtles that come from hundreds of miles away to lay their eggs. Sea daffodils spring up everywhere on these untouched, unsullied virgin coast, and to be sure, this must be our most enchanting offering to visitors. When you move westwards, you can see the loveliness of the Carapaz village, which is the first inhabited area you come to. The church and mosque together form a harmony, conveying a peace transcending time. Then there are old village houses decorated with bougainvillea and inviting accommodation. If you descend the north coast of this Carapaz village, you will begin a journey in history accompanied with the sound of waves with the inspiring sea view of the church of Aios Filion. The Basilica of Aios Trias in the village of Sipai is another valuable ruin in the Carapaz Peninsula. The most arresting remains of the basilica still extend today are the floor mosaics. Made of vividly coloured stones, they describe in loving detail a number of objects such as geometric designs, foliage and Christian symbols. The styles of these mosaics is that of the mosaic masters of the eastern Mediterranean, who originally had their centre in Antakya and they date back to prior to 535 AD. When you leave the Carapaz Peninsula and come to Boaz, you discover the tranquility of a small fishing port. In other words, it is the second address of fresh fish. If you change your direction westwards from your coastal journey, you might choose to visit the wonders of the Icon Museum, located in the centre of Iskele. The museum is outstanding, displaying some of the oldest icons in Cyprus. They are both icons and frescoes in the building, which was once used as a church, and their quality is such that you will not find anything like them in any other part of the world. Your journey to the historical city of Famagusta may be interrupted by a visit to the ancient port city of Salamis. Part of Salamis lies under the sea. The magnificent columns of the city, which stand at sea level, have impressed travellers from the time immemorial. The city of Salamis started as a settlement in the beginning of 11 BC and became one of the most important cities of Cyprus in antiquity. There are remains of a gymnasium, a street with a column, a later basilica, an amphitheatre and Roman bath in what was once a magnificent and wealthy city. St. Barnabas Church and Monastery is located on a flat area between the city of Famagusta and the ancient city of Salamis, which is the same that it is on the far west of the necropolis at Salamis. Saint Barnabas was born in Salamis to a Jewish family. After he was educated in Jerusalem, he tried to spread Christianity in Cyprus. However, he ended up martyred by his fellow citizens. The Emperor Zeno declared the independence of the Church of Cyprus 432 years after Saint Barnabas' death and even donated money for a monastery to be built there. The church was built in 477 AD and today you will find several icons, 
frescoes, and many precious artifacts displayed in the church. Famagusta is a port city in northern Cyprus and has been listed as a World Heritage Site. The old city, which has a rich past, is surrounded by thick walls and a number of civilizations successfully dominated in the city. The Othello Castle, which was the main venue of the famous tragedy written by William Shakespeare, was built during the Venetian period and is located within the walls of Famagusta. This is a city in which you will find many historical features cluttered together, created hundreds of years ago. With the Luzunian High Gothic architecture and magnificent stone masonry and the intriguing structure of the ramparts, the city of Famagusta is surely a very special place. St. Nicholas Cathedral is a jewel of the old city and is a unique building in the Far East, built between 1298 and 1312. The cathedral is one of the splendid examples of high Gothic art and it was where the Lusinian kings were crowned kings of Jerusalem. During the Ottoman period it was converted to a mosque with the addition of a minaret. On the west side of the cathedral you can see the two-floor dungeon of the Turkish poet Nama Kemal. The dungeon was built during the Ottoman period on the remains of the Venetian palace using the same masonry. The Ottoman poet, Nama Kemal, was exiled to Cyprus for 38 months and lived in this dungeon. Today the dungeon is used as a museum. As the crows fly north from Famagusta, you will find one of the highest points of the Carinya mountain range. This is Kantara Castle. Here it is possible to see both the north and east coast at the same time. The castle, which was built not only for defensive purposes but also for maintaining the passes in the east of the mountain range, has defied the centuries. Kantara Castle, built 700 meters above sea level on smooth rock, has a bird's eye view of the plains to the south. It is said to have been built in the 10th century for observation purposes. Studies indicate that the castle was used until 1525, by which time the Venetians did not consider the defensive function of the castle necessary and abandoned to its fate. Our journey continues along the north coast of the island enabling you to enjoy the untouched coast and deep blue sea. Along the way there is another place to bear in mind. Antiphonitis, the small church lying in the foothills of the Carinia range parallel to the coastline. Antiphonitis means the responding Christ. The church nestles in a valley and was the core of an important abbey. This church is one of the finest architectural examples in Cyprus remaining today. The inside walls are covered with frescoes from two distinctive periods. The earlier were painted between the 12th and 13th century and the later between the 14th and 15th century. Most of the frescoes depict scenes from the Bible such as, for example, the baptism of Jesus Christ and there are also numerous frescoes of saints the Virgin Mary, St. Simon Stylitz, St. Peter and many others. On the way towards the west and northern Cyprus there is another Crusader castle, Hufavento. The castle was built on one of the highest points of the Karinya mountain range and its situation is stunning. In the northern foothills of the Carinya range, you will find the coastal town of Carinya. Boasting plentiful accommodation, ancient buildings and unspoiled coasts, this is a city which is most attractive to tourists. 
Galapais Monastery still stands in its magnificence in a small outlying mountain village. The monastery was built in the 12th century and is another amazing example of Gothic architecture in the eastern Mediterranean. Palapais Monastery was built on a small plateau, 620 feet above the sea level, on the edge of the Carinya Range. The name of the monastery means Monastery of Peace, a corruption of the French name Abbe de la Paix. These days, the monastery refectory is used for artistic events, such as concerts by famous musicians from all over the world. The house of the famous English writer Laura Sturrell, the author of Bitter Lemons, written in Cyprus during 1953 to 56, is worth visiting and is near Balabais Monastery. If you go to the city of Carinha, you will find another castle skirted by the sea, Carinha Castle, the strongest castle in northern Cyprus, bears traces of the Byzantine, Lusinian, and Venetian periods. The most ancient merchant ship in the Mediterranean is on display in Carinha Castle, bringing you face to face with the very distant past. The modern explanatory animations in the rooms of the castle are designed to make the past come alive. They show the Lusinian dungeons, the Versi Neolithic habitations, the Actinis village graves, the Lusinian and Venetian towers, to name but a few. One of the most popular places for visiting tourists is the old Carinha harbour beside the castle. All along the edge of the harbour, there are restaurants sharing their fortune with fishing boats and yachts. Many of our newly wedded guests from all over the world partake of the charming environment of both Carinha castle and the harbour. There are many factors that make Carinha a rich city churches and mosques, beaches with a variety of water sports, rocky coasts and accommodation in unspoiled bays are only a few among many examples. If anyone wants to look down on Carinha from a higher position, it would be enough to pay visit to the picturesque village of Kami, clinging high in the skirts of the Carinha range. You can frame your authentic Mediterranean photos with bougainvillea blossoms in Carmi. The last castle, located at the highest point of the mountain range, is St. Hilarion Castle, giving visitors a bird's eye view of Carinha. St. Hilarion Castle is one of the most magnificent castles still standing. It is also said that St. Hilarion Castle was the inspiration of the castle in Walt Disney's film The Sleeping Beauty. The Queen's window in the castle gives visitors the opportunity and pleasure to look down from 732 metres above sea level onto a spectacular view, sweeping down through the foothills to the sea. After you leave the western end of the Karenya Range, you should pay a visit to the unique Maronite village called Korucham or Komajit. The Maronites settled in Cyprus approximately 1,200 years ago. At present, in general, Maronites live in scattered in different villages, except for this lovely village in the northern Cyprus, where the population is entirely Maronite. Before 1974, there were almost 2,000 people living in Korucham, but now there are only hundreds who remain. Aios Yorgios Church in Kormajit is a special symbol for Maronites, although the architecture is unexceptional but it's the most important place of worship for the Maronite community in Cyprus. Every Sunday, Maronites from all over the island flock to Aios Yorgios to attend to the service. The village is unique in that the mother tongue of the people who live there is Aramaic, influenced by Arabic. They are Maronite Catholics by faith, and they speak both Turkish and Greek. Leaving Kormajit village and journeying parallel to the west coast, you wind through the Mediterranean pine forests. 
then the forests give way to vast areas of amazing orange groves. The main city here is called Gzeljurt. Ah yes, Mamo's church is one of the principal treasures of the city and it is dedicated to a saint of the region. It was built during the Byzantine period and was rebuilt during the Lusinian period. When the Ottomans came, some additions were made to the church which is famous for its wood carvings. The icons and frescoes in the church are very interesting. The Gisellert Museum of Archaeology and Nature beside the church offers the visitor still more riches, such as a statue of Artemis, the crown of golden leaves from Soli, which are the most important pieces in the museum, and there are hundreds of other ancient and interesting artifacts. While Gizelut arrests your attention with the rich green of its orange groves, Levka stands out with its historical background and its tranquility. Levka is one of those rare cities which has preserved something of its original character from way back in Neolithic times. Of course, it has subsequently been overlaid by a succession of cultures – Byzantine, Lusinian, Venetian, Ottoman, Turkish, Greek and English. There are houses reflecting the architectural style of the Ottoman period, estimated to have been built between 1900 and 1938. These houses have typical domestic Ottoman architectural features with their alcoves, arches and mud brick walls. Furthermore, Lefke has a connection with the name given to Cyprus, which is a corruption of the Latin word cuprum meaning copper. This connection can be explained by the fact that Lefke used to be near vast copper reserves and large mines. People like Lefke because of its urban style which reflects a traditional life, its aqueducts, the Ottoman style houses and majestic palm trees. In addition to all this, you can still find a stone with the royal crest built in a memory of George II. The ruins of the city of Soli lie near Lefke. The history of the city goes back to 11 BC. The ancient city of Soli, one of the nine city kingdoms of Cyprus, takes its name from the Greek philosopher Solon. The real attractions of the city are its Roman amphitheater and the ruins of the great basilica with its beautiful mosaic floor. Among the depictions of the mosaics is a beautiful image of a swan surrounded by a vine motif featuring a bunch of grapes. The Roman amphitheatre in Soli was built on the remains of an earlier Greek amphitheatre and is on the edge of a hill from which you can see the sea in the distance. The seats for the audience are partially carved into the rock of the hill. Originally, the theatre had a seating capacity for 4,000 people. The Persian palace of Vuni was built to the west side of Soli. Apparently, the residents of Soli burned the palace to the ground, so today we must content ourselves with just the ruins of Vuni Palace, built on the flat top of the hill, with a breathtaking beautiful view over the sea. The palace had 137 rooms and was built by the Persian supporter, the king of the city kingdom of Marion, in order to spy on Soli, which had allied itself with the Greeks. The ruins of the palace mostly show the location of administrative offices, bedrooms, supply stalls, steam baths and workplaces. Unfortunately, it was only used for about 70 years before it was destroyed by citizens of Soli in 380 BC. If you look to the west from the hill of Vuni, you can easily see the unsullied coastal village of Limnidi, or in Turkish, Yeşilırmak. The advantage of Yeşilırmak is its location. It is located in the far west of northern Cyprus. The rocky island outcrop near the coast has no connecting point with the land, but it is where Cyprus's first inhabitants settled in Neolithic times. The village is located in a green valley and is famous not only for its taro and strawberry fields but also for orchards of a wide variety of fruit trees. Yeshil Urmak's genuine source of pride is its special grapevine 
with delicious bunches of Verigo grapes acknowledged in the Guinness Book of World Records as the biggest grapevine in the world. Northern Cyprus, with its 260,000 residents in five main regions, continues to be a multicultural treasure trove. It is a country that one should visit at least once in a lifetime. If you want to be a part of this living history, and if you want the contentment of being both in the Mediterranean and being an islander, please make sure that you follow up this invitation. Northern Cyprus is the country where the sunshine never ends. <laughs>